Good evening, everybody. Happy hump day. I'm excited to be here because I tell you what, I haven't done a Meet the Maker for a bloody long time. In fact, we're not doing a Meet the Maker tonight. We're going to do a Meet the Grower. And then I guess they make stuff. So anyway, I'm Sam. I'm Cheese Therapy and feeling very dapper tonight. I just finished a corporate tasting. And guess what? I had to follow John Howard. But see, I supplied everybody in the audience with cheese some chocolate, some wine, some crackers, some paste, some figs, a bit of coffee. <sighs> I think cheese therapy wins over John Howard. So anyway, there we go. Like before we jump in and meet our great, great guest, I want to know where you are from. Where are you from? What are you doing? Are you eating cheese right now? Are you drinking wine, having a gin like I know that my cat is? Not my cat. It's not my real cat. It's cat who works in our office here. I'm sure she's having a gin right now if she's watching. Um, so please pop it into the chat. Let me know where where uh, you are from, and let me introduce you to a couple of boys, Robert and Jason. These guys are from a place up in far north Queensland. It's called Mariba. Many of you have probably been there. And let's bring them on. All right, boys, you're going to have to cuddle up and get into shot. Yep. Which way are we going? This way? Oh, we go. Go. All right, here we are. Welcome. So this is Robert and Jason from Jake's Coffee. Jake's Coffee. Oh, I can't even get this stuff into shot. Hey, Welcome. everyone. Welcome from North Queensland. Um, the weather has been a lovely balmy 29 degrees today, so... Uh, we're enjoying it up here at least. There's our coffee beans. Oh, fantastic. So what I want to dive into, because Australian growing coffee in Australia, um, as you know, we certainly we certainly know, is such an unknown. Not many people uh, know about it. Um, Helen says hi. Uh, I had Hello, to Helen. listen to our little studio to do tonight's uh, little gig, but uh, she's at home watching. Thank God, but I'm sure she's getting the wine chilled down. Um, let's first talk about uh, your heritage, I guess, where you guys came from, and your father Nat, um, how he first came out here to to really be part of, you know, and create the industry that we have here now in Australia, and it is such a small industry but let's talk about sort of nat your father and um where he first i guess came across coffee and uh learned how to grow it all right well that was an interesting story back in africa uh many years ago back in the 60s 70s my grandparents were growing coffee over in east africa on the slopes of kilimanjaro and on my mother's side linda um they were growing tea in kenya and tea and coffee met, but uh, as you can imagine, coffee won that race and they moved over to Australia, decided that Mariba, which had won awards in the past, back in the 1890s to 1920s for the, in the, on the London, London shows for really, really high quality coffee, this was the perfect spot to re-kickstart the coffee growing in Australia. And it has, Mariba is now the, the largest coffee growing area in, in Australia itself. So we produce more coffee for everywhere, um, but less than 1% of all the coffee that is consumed in Australia is actually grown here. Wow, isn't that amazing? And, you know, I've been up there a couple of times to, to visit you boys and tell you what, it's a day I will never forget going to your place, but we can probably talk about that a little bit later. But um, it's interesting, Atherton Tablelands really is a food bowl of Australia. Um, talk us through sort of the agricultural environment that is Atherton Tablelands. So I'm, I'm Jace, Rob's brother. We run the plantation together here. So 
we're, we're actually sitting in our cafe, which is in the heart of the plantation. We're on 200 acres here in, as, in Mariba, as you told the viewers. Um, so the, the coffee plantation, we're just sort of coming up to harvest very soon. Within um, almost within a week or, or two, we've got some ripening in some of our blocks, which will be harvesting. So it's, it's quite an, a busy time of year for us at the moment. But as Sam was mentioning there, Atherton Tablelands is in the tropics, so we can grow everything up here. Lots of citrus, mangoes. I'm sure you all love mangoes as well. I don't know anybody that doesn't, so, besides a, a couple of the crazy people around. Um, they're absolutely fantastic area, volcanic soils. We're up on the Tablelands, which means we're up on a hill. We're at a bit of altitude up here. Perfect conditions for coffee. Perfect conditions for the, the sugar, the bananas, as I suggested, the, the mangoes, the citrus, but uh, absolutely fantastic climate in Mariba itself. 300 sunny days, and we need those sunny days for the uh, for the coffee to actually flower, and then create the beautiful red coffee cherries, which, as Jason just mentioned, are going to be harvested on Monday. Monday is the beginning of harvest. How exciting! Wow, that's absolutely amazing. And that's one of the key uh, sort of, you know, things about Mariba and FNQ is that because you've only got those 60 wet days, you can really, you know, sort of time your harvest so well. Because I know that uh, one of our growers, Zenfelds down in Byron Bay, their, um, their harvest season is about three months long. Whereas for you guys, it's only about two weeks and that's done for the rest of the year, isn't it? Bit longer. A bit longer than two two weeks. We do have um, we do go through the coffee a couple of times. So my father had invented the world's first coffee harvester, which we still use today. So rather than having three hundred people picking the coffee like in some other countries, we have one man, which is either my father or my brother here. He drives the other coffee harvester. We have two harvesters now, and um, I'm in the processing plant processing it. So I take all the skins off. What people don't realize is. That is what a coffee bean looks like. So it's actually a fruit. It's a cherry, essentially. And on the inside of that cherry, when you squeeze it out, you have the two halves. And you can see a lovely little bit of shimmer on there as well. So that there is the coffee fruit. There's not much of it, but that's actually the coffee fruit. So when you'll have that, you've got the two sides of the bean. You take another couple of layers of skin off there, and then you'll actually finally get down to the actual coffee bean that you roast. That's just called a green bean. And when you get to the green bean, that is when that's dried and roasted, you'll lose another 20, 15 to 20% because of the moisture content. So out of that, from the cherry all the way through to the roasted bean, six kilos of cherry generally gets you about 850 grams of coffee. So you can imagine the process, the shrinkage as it goes down. The beautiful thing about our plantation is that we recycle absolutely everything in the coffee process. So any of these skins, they go back onto the onto the coffee, so we, we let them either directly directly under the trees with a spreader or we let them compost down for a bit and then use that, that beautiful nutrient rich soil. Any of the water that we use to wash the wash the lovely the shimmer off the coffee beans, which is the sugars, we um we utilize back in our storage dam, which then we pump back onto the onto the coffee bean onto the coffee trees because we can't can't waste all the all the goodness. I mean, think of the power in that sugar and that water. We utilize that that as fertilizer back on the trees. Yeah. Also, yeah. Now um, earlier you mentioned that only one percent of Australia's uh, coffee that is consumed in this country only one percent is actually grown in Australia. I think it's yeah. a bit less than one percent, but yeah, you, you get the picture. So it's a it's a very small percentage. Now it's not that we don't want to drink Australian coffee. Firstly, I think there's two parts. One part is that Australians don't know that we actually grow coffee, that's but the exactly. industry here in Australia is very small, isn't it? Uh, the coffee drinking industry is big. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's overtaken pretty much everything else besides what um, water. I think it overtook beer recently. I'm not sure where it is on the on the uh, wine wine list because obviously we do like a bit of wine in the in these strange COVID times. But uh, yeah, people cannot get enough of coffee, which is what we've found. And um, so be able to. We're actually going to be planning out another nursery. It takes five years. 
five years for coffee trees to come into production. So you have to think ahead in the game. We have 85,000 85, coffee trees out here at the moment. They're all Arabica, they're the variety called Katuwai Roja. And uh, we're going to be planting out another another 60,000 plus trees. That's the red variety. Yeah, yeah fantastic. But um, the amount of coffee that's actually grown in this country, you know, how many growers do you think there are in all of Australia? I think there's about 30 of us. A lot of lot of smaller farms down in the northern rivers and um, I suppose southern Queensland. There's a couple of little areas where you'll have the microclimates, where you have the all the conditions that are, are right for it. So down in that Byron Bay area, there's a couple of farms down there, northern New South Wales. And uh, what you'll find is Mariba, since we have the, the perfect tropical climate to grow a fruit, as well as having having that 300 sunny days a year where we can we can really dial in exactly when these these beans become ripe and we can we can get it out there. So Mariba has got probably around four or five major growers and we know that there's another two or three actually coming online in the next few years as well. Which is nice to see. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So uh, in terms of, uh, you know, where people are getting their coffee from, we're looking at places like Colombia, like uh, Ethiopia, and, and you know, places that are pretty much half a planet away. Um, how does Australian coffee differ from those traditional coffee growing areas? Uh, well, for one, a lot of the a lot of the labour that's used in in those countries, um, it doesn't get paid very well. So that's where you'll come across all the things where they're trying to uh, pay the people a uh, fair trade coffee, where they're trying to get a little bit more coffee to the far, uh, money to the farmers as well as the actual workers. But you're still talking a pittance. So over here, the conditions are a lot better. Um, as I said, to harvest the coffees, we, we have a lot one, of one or two people in the mechanised over here, uh, as well as obviously the, the the good conditions obviously there are farms over there as, as well that that have um ideal conditions for coffee growing too but um with the australian coffee we've got the perfect climate where we are um and obviously down in, in northern new south wales as well where we can we can control it without having to worry about any slave labor in our coffee we don't have the pests and diseases that they have over there so in south america they have what's called coffee leaf rust, which is starting to really affect all the farmers, a lot of the farmers around the place, and uh, the coffee borer beetle. So Australian Quarantine is, is doing a very good job keeping it out for now. So we don't have to spray any of the insecticides or fungicides that are layering on. It creates a quite a very clean green coffee is what we call it. So um, in, in, in that aspect, it's, it's a lot better for the environment because we're not having to put on all that fungicides or or other chemicals, or other chemicals that, they, that they have to have to use. It's, it's actually quite sad that they actually have to do that over in those countries. And we live here on the plantation too, so we don't want that near any chemicals near our family either. So. Um, uh, what I was going to ask you was about altitude, because we often hear that uh, you know, sort of altitude is best for coffee growing, and uh, but you know, we certainly see. Uh, many pockets around the world that are producing amazing coffees that necessarily aren't at altitude. And, you know, Atherton Tablelands, even though, yeah, it's, sort of, it's not what you call a, a, you know, a real proper altitude. And certainly Zenfelds and all those Northern Rivers coffee growers are nowhere near um, altitude. How much does altitude affect the flavours in the coffee? Altitude essentially affects density of the beans. And so with the density of the beans, what you're talking about there is, it's generally regarded a higher quality quality bean. Where we are up here, um, we've, I think I've talked to you in the past about the, um, the northern rivers, but what, what it is is with the higher altitudes of the coffees, the trees are in more of a stress because there's less oxygen up there or less carbon dioxide to actually to process. So the beans are stressed out, takes them longer to grow and, and, and mature. So, and they, they create a harder bean. 
that's again where we excel up here in North Queensland is with that 300 sunny days a year, we have the, have the stress essentially of just like in the higher altitudes of the 300 sunny days. So we can actually create, create the hardness of our being by water stressing the trees. So you're creating that natural, natural stress by just not layering out as much water. So we get the density, density where we are um, by creating the stress using our climate. So we don't need to have the higher altitudes. We are at about 1,340 feet above sea level. The problem with so the higher altitudes, yes. problem with the higher altitudes um, for mechanized harvesting is the rainfall. Generally, the rainfall is very sporadic all throughout the whole the whole year. So you'll have you'll have rain that happens, you know, in the middle of um, July, August, September, all the way through. And when you have that, you'll have sporadic flowering, which means sporadic ripening. So when you'll find a coffee farm overseas, what you'll find is the coffee beans are actually riper all year round, and they have to go out and hand pick, pick off the red cherries and leave the rest to grow. That doesn't work over here because we have the mechanized uh, harvesters. So that, in that aspect, you've got the higher altitudes with the, with the more rainfall, but that means you can't have the, have the mechanized harvesting. And that's a problem that I suppose the South Americans are actually going to have to overcome being that uh, we want everyone in the world to have a better living and a better wage. So you're going to have to be able to harvest the coffee in a more cost effective way than use using, um, I suppose, cheap labor. Yeah. Um, now you mentioned mechanization and, uh, you know, when I was having a big chat with your dad, uh, when I was up there last, he mentioned about, he told me this story about how he's sitting on a beach on Noosa and came up with the idea of, of uh, your coffee harvester that has pretty much revolutionized harvesting around the world for coffee. Tell us about that story. <laughs> All right, essentially, on the travels around from, um, they started in Perth. So when they flew over from East Africa, they landed in Perth and then they went for a road trip looking for the perfect spot to grow coffee. And they got around down through Melbourne and Adelaide, too cold, up to Sydney, and then they ended up at Bondi Beach. I'm sure you, uh, not Bondi, is it Bondi? No, 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 no. Yeah, ended up in Sydney, obviously not the ideal climate. But what they have on the beach is they have machines, essentially um, tractors that come along and churns up the sand to get rid of the rubbish that people leave there. This was back in the late 70s, sort of early 80s. So no coffee harvesters in the world then. It was hand-picked in Africa. On um, grandparents' plantation, they had uh, truckloads. They had big tipper truckloads full of um, the Africans that they'd go pick up and take out to the, the actual coffee fields to go pick wow. coffee. So, so he was sitting there watching watching this, this I suppose, sand harvester harvesting all the uh, all the rubbish and in in the sand i suppose there'd be a lot of cigarette buckets back in the <laughs> 70s <laughs> picking all those up and i think a day a day or so later he saw a, a street sweeper you know where they got the little brush so i got it got his head thinking well if we can do this maybe if we shake the trees then we can pick it up off the ground with the side brushes and come along but then you'll have the sticks and the stones and the leaves, but it got his brain brain going. Surely there's a way that we can we can make coffee harvestable. And uh, yeah, so it was about 78, he made his way over. And by 1985, after we planted out 120,000 trees and um, started building a coffee harvester. And rather than shaking the trees and letting the, the cherries fall on the floor and having to pick them up, there's actually a couple of conveyors directly under the trees with catch plates that go pretty much interlocked. So when they shake shake the coffee coffee cherries, comes along, they fall off onto the onto the conveyors and get taken up into side hoppers, and then that gets taken straight into into the processing facility where I I happily sit and and nurture the beans all the way through the rest of the, the process. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it's really only picking off those ripe cherries. They're the ones that are vibrated off the branch. Correct. So when, when you look at a coffee being a fruit, 
as it gets as it gets to its red ripe stage, what you'll find is it's like any other fruit. That tree is ready to reproduce, so it's happy to let the uh, the the ripe cherries go. So when when you go over with the harvester, you've got the fingers going through, and you can actually selectively take off just the ripe cherries because the tree's ready to to let them go. Let them be. Where <laughs> Out you go and enjoy the world. Whereas the green coffee, when it's on, on the branch, we'll on. it'll actually hold on. So it's a lot harder to get off. So what you do is you let that ripen up if there's any green coffee cherries on the trees. And, um, and then you'll end up with, with your red cherries ready to, ready to harvest and, and go again. So, so the, the objective of the harvester driver, um, well, and my father, who's, who's still driving the other harvester at the moment, he'll be out this, this year as well. Um, is to just gently shake the berries off the trees and leave the green behind. So it's not a not a race to get in everything off the tree and strip everything off. If if there is green green cherry, we just want to let that ripen for another couple of weeks and then yep. just go back out again and gently pick that as well. So our machines are that powerful; they can probably tear the leaves off the trees as well. If you want to, we, we wouldn't want to do that because we wouldn't have a crop next year. So yeah. just be gentle. After a harvest, um, Robert, if you can just hold that branch up. After a harvest, now, beans cannot grow on that branch again. Is that right? That's right. So where you see coffee beans on a, on a branch or coffee cherries, once that's picked, coffee will never grow in that spot again. Obviously, with this branch, it's not attached to a tree anymore, so that really won't happen. That's my but, <laughs> but uh, what you'll what you'll find is you're always requiring new growth. So when you come along on the branch here, you'll see that there was a, obviously a bit of bit of coffee from the previous year there. All this is is brand new growth. So what you're going to find is you're going to have brand new coffee cherries growing along all the new growth on the on the coffee tree problem problem that you face there is you'll have a lot of wood after a few years so we actually cut the trees back down to um, pretty much knee height and stump the trees and let them regenerate so one year and they're they're back up to pretty much three quarters of the height that they were and then the next year they produce essentially a double crop because all those new leaves and all those new shoots on those branches are, are ripe for, for the coffee. You would have saw that when you went, you came walking through the plantation as well. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. And you know, sort of about half a million people saw my little uh, video, which was actually filmed in your plantation. The perfect place because Australians really do need to try this stuff, Australian growing oh. coffee. Jake, <laughs> it's fantastic and I love it. And this is what I'm drinking at home right now. Man, it smells good. Now, let's talk about uh, your actual location. How far from Cairns and Port Douglas are you? So, we're about um, from Cairns. Um, if you drive a little bit um, north towards Port Douglas, um, you've got the Coranda Range. Uh, we're about 45 minutes on the Cairns side of, of Mariba. So as you head up up the actual range, and we have what, 85,000 coffee trees up here at, at the moment with a, a cafe and restaurant which you can come visit, have lunch, have a coffee, espresso martini if you so desire, do and um, do a little tour of the plantation or, or an extended tour of the plantation. So you can do a, a Sam Penny tour, the VIP tour. Yeah. <laughs> tour, VIP tour. Now th this, let me tell you about this VIP tour. This VIP tour. Uh, when you drive into Jake's property, uh, there's little signs on the side of the driveway that say, give way to aircraft. You just go, oh, in the middle of a coffee plantation, where on earth is there going to be an aircraft? Sure enough, uh, their old man, Nat, pulls, pulls out of the hamper, uh, out of the hamper, a hangar, an ultralight, a gyrocopter, and uh, then forces Helen and I to go up for a, a flight around Mareeva. And I tell you what, we are petrified beforehand. Oh, there you go. Can you actually take a flight there? Yep. Ah, oh, and segways. No, no segways anymore. Beginning of COVID, we, we gave the segways up. Yeah, Just so I tell you what, 
what an amazing experience it was to go up in a gyrocopter. And I had sworn all my life I'd never go up in one of those things. But the way Nat describes it and the safety of it, wow, it was so fun. And as you pass across your plantation, there is no better thrill. I'd rather do that than swim with a shark any day. <laughs> so what else can people expect? One of the great things, I love your video. When you go there, they'll shove you into a room to sit on some bus seats and watch a video. But I'll tell you what, it's pretty funny and has a great history of the making of coffee. But if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, all the way through goes from the history back from, from our family, where we've come from, the trials and tribulations, the coffee, how it's grown, all the way from its seed stage, all the way through growing the seedlings, up through to the uh, to the harvesting, to the processing, all the way through the roasting, and even we, we teach you how to make the coffee as well. Because it's every every step along that stage, you can change the flavor of the coffee. And all the way through to that that last stage, which is really important. We'll call it the journey. Or the journey, journey the stage of the, the journey. journey of the Making that coffee, that you, you might have had a coffee before in your life and went, oh, that's terrible. But it might have just been the barista not extracting it correctly or, or burning the milk. So all the way through the, the whole process, if you're given a, given a good coffee, which we definitely have up here in, in North Queensland and uh, in Australia, we've got to be very, very happy with the quality of our coffee. We've actually won the best milk-based coffee in the whole of Australia, that award before, so wow, we're, how we're good that? Happy with that. Yeah. So, and you'll teach people sort of, you know, how to how to sort of avoid having those bitter coffees and all those kinds of things. There. Yep, that's all the way through. So, yeah, teaches you about over extraction or under extraction, how to set your grinder, and that's all through our, our coffee tour, which is at a very reasonable price. 15 bucks includes a cup of coffee and a taste of liqueur and a movie and then you get to go and have a look at the coffee trees and, and harvesters and talk to rob and i if we're around as well so yeah, which well, we usually how, have. life doesn't get any better than that now let me ask you how do you boys both take your coffee black, <laughs> Short black. i have a long black, black. black. just enjoy it because I, I like to save in my coffee but i'll have probably around um what, eight to ten double shot long blacks a day. Ooh. So Sam, when you say that, it's just like when you work on a coffee plantation, you're always too busy. You just sort of walk past the espresso machine, grab whatever's going, and carry on. <laughs> so it, it's a busy lifestyle up here. Oh, it is. Now, a question that I was asked earlier because they knew that uh, you guys were coming on. What's the best way to store your beans? If you've opened the bag, um, how do you store them? Well, the bag that you're holding in your hand, if you'd like to show the camera, actually has a, a ripper zipper seal on the back there. So it's actually a very specially designed bag. Um, and what it actually has is there's a layer of foil in, inside that to stop any of the air. So oxygen is what breaks down, breaks down the coffee. So if you can avoid having oxygen, ideally, you'd Put the zipper up, grab your vacuum cleaner and suck the little little valve on the back here and then you get all the air out but nobody has a vacuum cleaner just sitting in their, in their kitchen. So you can actually put a vacuum cleaner on that and... And it'll suck all the air out. That's right. Yeah. So we don't yeah. normally wreck that. But that would be the most ideal or in a vacuum, vacuum jar. A lot of people will say, oh, yeah. well, what if I put it in the fridge or the freezer? I said, yes, that... Especially up in here, up in North Queensland, we don't recommend it too much. Because it's humid. The humidity. When you have humidity and coffee, and so you bring it out of the freezer, which slows down the oxidization, which is great. You want to try and avoid that. It will keep it fresh. But if you put your bag of coffee on the bench and you have humidity, it's actually going to absorb moisture, which will degrade the coffee quicker. So if you do, if you do keep your coffee in the freezer or the fridge, Make sure you pull it out, you use what you need to, and then put it straight back in to avoid that problem. Otherwise, you'll, you'll be doing worse for your coffee than actually just leaving it in, the, in a ceramic jar. But ideal, ideal place to, to store your coffee is in a, a cool, dry cupboard. Um, 
in a vacuum container or a vacuum sealed container. So just to recap on that, our packaging is, is specially designed, unopened, the coffee will last a long time because we've got the special aluminium foil that's actually built into the bag. So there's a lot of technology in our bags. So it's taken us many years to actually get to the level of packaging that we're using today. So it's sort of, and we're very happy with it. And it's got the one-way air valve on the back as well. So it can be actually fresh packed straight after roasting. So without having to degas the coffee and make it stale before we put it in. Uh, very good. Well, hey, I should show people, share with people where, how they get, uh, now, uh, how can I, how do I do this? Uh, so if you head on to our website, which I'm trying to work out how to do that right now. Um, you think, you think I'd, I'd know how to do this, but no, I don't. You get free cheese, must, we understand. It must be a little boat <laughs> hey? your performance. Yeah. Have another coffee. We'll I know, I think, I think I should. So here we are. All right, so oh this God. is the coffee website. I'm going to show you how you can get your hands on some of this Jake's coffee. Now, something to point out with Jake's coffee is that they um, roast the coffee and then pretty much two days later they send it down to us. Now, we only hold usually about two weeks supply in our warehouse down in Geelong. So that means that what's going out to you is freshly roasted coffee straight from these guys. So you head into... Here and Jake's coffee, and a little bit about who is Jake's. We all know who Jake's are now. Um, now they also they have a medium roast, Nespresso roast, and Nespresso coffee pods. Now, hey, I've got a question. What's the? How do you get an espresso roast compared to a medium roast? What's the difference? Sounded like you're almost telling a joke there. So how? <laughs> Um, essentially, a medium roast coffee is not roasted as long as the espresso. The longer you roast the coffee, the darker it gets, the more of the compounds you lose. There's thousands of compounds in, in a coffee bean when it's, when it's in its raw state. And if you can tease out those compounds, you'll get delicious caramels is what we have. We've got the caramel flavor, we've got a bit of a hint of chocolate and honey. So we had a we had a bit of a tasting in Japan because they're starting to go a bit nuts for our coffee over there too, and they were very impressed with the with the freshness, the the caramel and the honey honey tones of it. Um, but the longer that you roast it, the more of those compounds you're going to lose. So when you when you get one of those old Italian dark roasts, I'm pretty sure the dark roasts and it turns really bitter because it's getting closer to charcoal. Pretty sure that goes back to the days of, of the Italians roasting it during, during the war where they didn't have enough coffee beans, so they, they mixed in all these other, uh, what were they, Ch chicory beans? Chicory, yeah. yeah. And they'll make a very, very strong coffee. You can spot it by, if you look in people's coffee <laughs> grinders, they'll be black, dark, oily beans. Yeah, so and you know you're gonna get a bit of coffee if it's over roasted. So for our espresso roast, what we do is something a bit special. So our medium roast, it, if you've got a, a really, really good palate and you can taste all, all the different uh, flavors, the medium roast is, is, is delicious for that. But if you like it with a little bit more punch, that's where you'll have our espresso roast. So what we do is we'll roast half the espresso roast in each, each batch uh, to medium, release the medium beans, and then bring the rest of it to the, the espresso. So what you'll find is the our espresso is a medium, medium dark, blend. and so it's and with the blend of the medium there. So we don't go really dark and bitter. We just have that extra little bit of punch for beautiful golden crema on our coffee, as well as the mixing of keeping all those flavors and the compounds in the in the medium with the medium roast in there. So you get the best of both worlds with the espresso, or if you just like that more more of a, a smooth all the way through and you can taste all the delicious compounds in there, then that's where you do the medium beans. So the espresso roast is, is we have specifically designed for espresso machines, and yep. made espresso roast. So the home, from little home domestic espresso to commercial. So we have the beans and the ground, which you can um, purchase there as well. So perfect, perfect. 
Well, guys, it's been such a great chat. I think we need to let people get back to their their wines. I am going to. Luckily, I came into the office because I know that we're about out at home. So I'm going to take this home and jump. Uh, this is going straight into the grinder tomorrow morning. Now. Man, the smell of this. Now, everybody, you really, I would love it if you jumped onto our website, cheesetherapy.com.au, and went to our coffee section and try Jake's coffee. Support an Australian coffee grower, and I am I guarantee you're going to be surprised how good Australian growing coffee is. We grow a great bean in this country. It's just that not enough Australians know that we actually grow the great stuff here. So I want you to jump on there. Please support our Australian farmers like these two boys, Robert and Jason. Jake, they do a fantastic job. And if you're going to head up to far north Queensland, Port Douglas uh, or Cairns, just make that short drive up to Mariba, Atherton Tablelands. You know, to go and visit them and uh, tell them Sam sent you. It doesn't get you anything free or anything like that. Hey, you never know. But I tell you what, it's it's such a great place to go. And the drive there as well, going up the range is so beautiful. Boys, absolutely fantastic having you on tonight. I really enjoyed it and I love working with you. You know that Helen and I really appreciate the work that you guys put in. Maybe, maybe you could Facebook us live when we're harvesting on the harvester in the next few yeah. weeks or so. That'll be something exciting for the viewers. Hell yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Well, uh, we're, let's we're the real deal. We're the real, people, the real people, the real so, farmers. All a family business out here. Again, I'm processing the coffee, and Jason's harvesting it, and my father's harvesting it, and we, we have two beautiful girls each that we have on, on the plantation too. We're, we're growing them up to, to come and take it over. So that's a couple of years away, but we're getting closer. Yeah, fantastic. All right, guys, well, have a great night. And everybody out there, thank you very much. Please support Jake's and our Australian uh, farmers, Australian grown coffee. You're going to be pleasantly surprised. Thanks. Thanks. And don't forget, the coffee goes well in an espresso martini too, so it doesn't just have to be in the morning. That's, okay. that's, for, that's for our next chat when we have our next <laughs> chat. We'll show you how to do that. <laughs> okay. Just learn, just learn, just learn.